Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy, a podcast that looks at the inspiration, intention, and actionable steps to help you jumpstart joy in the world, in your life, and in other people's lives. This is your host, Paula Jenkins. Welcome to episode 169. This week's show includes an interview with Jess Ekstrom of the amazing Headbands of Hope, which is a company that just started out of her dorm room and sells headbands. And for every headband purchased, she and her company give a headband to a child who is in cancer treatment. She also started the amazing Mic Drop Workshop, which is for women who want to explore a speaking career. And I met Jess at the amazing Mavenly Convention, which ran last summer. And I was immediately delighted because Jess presented a quote by Will Farrell during her speech, and it was one of my favorites. <laughs> I went up and introduced myself afterwards, and I am just delighted that she joined me for the show this week. If you're new to Jumpstart Your Joy, first I want to say welcome, and I'm so glad that you're here. This show is all about finding the inspiration, intention, and action that leads to more joy in your life and in the world, and it's been going on for about four and a half years now. I'm Paula Jenkins, the host of Jumpstart Your Joy. My background, if you're new, I've been a project manager for 20 years, and five years ago, I decided to go back and get a life coaching certificate through the CLCC. Uh, I am now a lead coach through them, a certified life coach, and I have found a really happy home in helping women find their voice and often create a podcast. I also do regular life coaching as well. If you want to find out more about me or the show, the website is at jumpstartyourjoy.com. And if you would like to find show notes, which has links to all of Jess's information about her mic drop workshop and where you can buy a headband as well, you can find those show notes at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash Jess. While you're there, you can also get a really awesome cheat sheet, as I like to call it. If you want to start your own podcast, I am happy to share with you all of the hardware and software that I use to create this show every week. I am definitely self, self-taught self and it is a joy to help others find their voice and find their way to create their own podcast, which is a really awesome way to support your business. You can find that worksheet on the website as well. There's a start a podcast button and you can find it right there. Also, just to check in about myself a little bit and where I've been in this last week, I had the total joy of heading up to Petaluma, California for the weekend retreat that's the kickoff for the the Courageous Living Coach Certification Program, which is run by Kate Swoboda, also known as Kate Courageous. And it was such a treat to be with the 11 members of the leadership team, with Kate herself, and 45 women who are embarking on a year-long program to become life coaches. So excited to be a lead coach with that program this year. The other exciting big news is that I am in the last week of my nine to five job. I'm about to jump out and be a full-time entrepreneur doing a mix of project management and coaching. And so I do have room for a couple more clients. If you are curious, I would love to hear from you and you can reach out at jumpstartyourjoy at gmail.com. In the spirit of really kind of teasing out the parts of this conversation with Jess that tie in with the inspiration, intention, and action to bring you to more joy, I just, I really love that Jess is inspired by several different things as she looked to create a new company and is now the CEO of this company. She had seen while she was working with the Make-A-Wish Foundation that children often wore a headband after chemo treatment, but that there was no one place that children were getting these. And so seeing that need and then having had the founder of Tom's uh, Shoes come to speak at her college, she partnered those two ideas, used inspiration from two different ideas to then set up the company that she now runs. And I, I think it's so interesting. The other piece that totally stands out for me about this, especially if you're looking to create a company of your own, is that 
the need that she fills, and she talks about this in the interview, is so simple and so beautiful. And so in, I know a lot of people in coaching people, it's so easy to jump to the big idea and feel like the thing that you choose to do is huge and a game changer. And I want to point out that oftentimes the simple and small things can be as big of a game changer as the really big ideas that sometimes we think we need to find. And so, and, and I love too that Jess is, has a lot to say about taking action, even when you feel some fear and how to really think differently about that. And that's where the quote from Will Ferrell comes in. So without further ado, let's get on to this really amazing conversation with Jess Ekstrom. Welcome to the show. Today, you guys, I am so excited to have Jess Ekstrom of Headbands of Hope on the show. Welcome, Jess. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes. Um, really exciting because we met in Atlanta, what was that, July? End of July. Yeah, July at the Mavenly Women Work and Worth Conference, which was yes. amazing. It was. I will put a link out to Mavenly, and if folks are not listening to that podcast, it is very good as well. So yeah, it's really good. And then um, Kate, the the founder, just released her new project called Work Well, that I'm mm -hmm. super excited about. Just kind of like wellness around working, because I'm sure as women entrepreneurs or just women going for it, sometimes um, that slips away from us. It does. It really, really does. And that's honestly, because we're recording mid-December, and that's like what I'm mapping out for next year is like, how do I plan out more time that's, you know, mm -hmm. working in the business and then working with clients, but also giving myself a little bit of a breather because I've been at it a bit much. Exactly. Exactly. I'm going to attempt next week, you know, as the holidays to do no email, which has been a work in progress for me. Like this year, I've been trying to put in place some practices that have helped me be a little less glued to my inbox and look up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. That sounds delightful. I can never get to inbox zero. And I think it's like kind of a myth. So <laughs> I'm trying to get there. Oh, get I have to be at inbox zero. That's why I'm I'm so addicted to it is because if there's like one thing lingering, even if it's just like a sale on Spanx, I have to like click it. <laughs> it's still because I'm like, it. I can't. Yeah. So I need to like let, learn to let things wait. And I also hired a, an assistant that's been super helpful of like going into my inbox and I've never had an assistant that's done that before. And so if there's anything urgent, she'll let me know. And so that kind of gives you peace of mind when you're away from it. It does. I can see that being very yeah. valuable. Well, yeah. let's jump into the first question I ask everybody, which is, yeah, what did you love most as a child or in school? What were your earliest sparks of joy? Oh, my gosh. I loved, always loved food. <laughs> mm. um, so food always got me excited. But as a kid, um, I was such a tomboy. And um, I remember, like, uh, probably the best gift I've ever gotten was um, I, my sister went for Christmas one year. She put me on a scavenger hunt to eventually find this skateboard that she had bought at, like, a Goodwill and spray painted with my name on it. And mm -hmm. it was, like, my favorite thing. The only bad part was I had no idea how to skateboard. <laughs> So I would, um, we had this like long driveway and so I would start at the top and sit on it and ride it all the way down and ended up burning a hole in my shoe because that was the only way I knew how to stop. But I would still call it skateboarding. Like I was going skateboarding, even though I was riding it on my butt. <laughs> I love it. My, my favorite thing. Yeah. Still my yeah. favorite gift. It is a good gift. I had a little yellow skateboard that I think I rode most of the time in a very similar fashion, <laughs> yeah. like down the court, and then I'd walk exactly. back up. It was like skiing. I still don't understand it. I'm like, how do you stand up straight? Like, how does it not fall underneath your feet? But the be like the best part was like in you know middle school because I think I was like in sixth grade when I got it. I would like go and be like, yeah, I'm gonna go skateboarding this weekend. And they'd be like, all the boys would be like, oh, you skateboard? And I'm like, yeah, I do. But they never, <laughs> they never knew my secret. <laughs> so good. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> and, and 
so now you're the CEO and founder of Headbands of Hope. And I love yeah. your mission and the history. Will you kind of, you, it's probably a, a fun story to tell all the way through. So if you want to weave in both like your mission yeah. and history, I would, I would love for the audience to hear it. In 2012, I started Headbands of Hope. And this is when I was in college. I was interning for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And I saw a lot of kids that were losing their hair to chemotherapy and they'd be offered wigs and hats. When a lot of them, I found, like wouldn't wear them, and I was I was confused. I'm like, you know, why are we offering these to the kids when I see a lot of them wearing headbands after hair loss? So I looked up organizations. I said, okay, there's got to be something out there that's giving headbands to kids with cancer because I would see them wearing them all the time, and I realized that that was a need that wasn't being met. No one was doing that, and no one had maybe made that connection. So in just this kind of like spur of the moment thing, I, I just decided I was going to do it myself. It was funny that actually the founder of Tom Shoes had come and spoken at my school like a few months prior and talked about this, you know, one for one model that he created that he wanted people to replicate to create more businesses of good. And so I just kind of was like, oh, I'll do that with headbands. So at Headbands of Hope, for every headband sold, we donate one to a child with cancer. I started, sold my first headband to my mom, April 25th, 2012. And to date, we donated headbands to every single children's hospital in America and 15 countries. So it's been a whirlwind, lots of ups and downs. It's been a really cool experience. Yeah, it, it's so amazing. I mean, I think there's that that interesting blend of what touching on something that fills an amazing need and a gap that you saw, but it's also I, I know from so Danny Wood of New Kids on the Block was on the show, be, and he was talking. He has a cancer, um, a charity. He named Remember Betty, which is an honor of, honor of his mom who died of breast cancer, mm-hmm. and. He also saw this need that was so kind of niche and practical yet meaningful. And so he helps people who are in the midst of cancer treatment and helps pay for like Mm -hmm. a mortgage or gets them a ride to treatment. Like it's, it's simple and niche, but it's so deeply needed because it impacts people's lives so deeply. And so I love that, you know, you, you found a neat, a, a niche there as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that impact of of giving someone a child a headband and what it what it mm-hmm. means and what it does for them. Yeah, and I kind of like what you pointed out about the other example of just like some of the little things and the simplicity mm-hmm. because I think sometimes when we want to start something, we think that anything you know that we create has to be something that is like earth shattering, complex, and we have to be the next you know, Spotify or where we disrupt the music industry or the yeah. next Airbnb. And, and it really, um, it doesn't have to be that. Uh, you can provide value in some of the more simple things that people mm-hmm. need. And the headband for me was that. And it's, um, even though it might be a small accessory, it can make such a huge impact with these kids that are already going through so much. And not only are they worried about their health, but being a kid and a lot of the teens too, you're in such a already kind of questionable place in your life of your identity and Mm -hmm. self-esteem and making friends. And so we like to think that, you know, the headbands aren't just about, oh, you need something to put on your head because you're losing your hair. It's making them feel like a kid again. It's it's making them feel good about themselves when they look in the mirror. It's a symbol of strength and solidarity. And it's this little gesture that when I've learned going into the hospital so much the past six and seven or seven years, um, it's really those those little things and those little moments during the day that can totally just bring like just a hint of light that can really brighten up the room because it can be such um, grueling and dark times, not just for the kids, but for the families. So yeah. if we can add that sense of just normalcy and something fun and positive, then that's what we want to do. And that even evolved into um, a program that we started called DIY Headband Days. So um, we actually send flower crown kits and bandanas that can be colored and the kids can actually design and create their own headbands in the hospital. So it's a little bit more of an interactive experience. And uh, that's worked really well for us and been really cool to see the kids be able to kind of spread their wings too. 
Oh, I love that so much. I bet that's so much fun for them to like kind of dig in and make their own headband. That would have been, yeah. I, I mean, I would still want to do that, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I know. Like, like it's so funny because when we sometimes will go to the hospitals and like administer it and I'll kind of get caught up like making my own headband and then I'll look up and I'm like, oh man, I need <laughs> <laughs> need to like go help the kids. <laughs> I really want to like highlight and underline. I know what you said there was so important about we get so overwhelmed and kind of what worried that the thing we choose to do has to be this earth shattering thing. But mm-hmm. I love the what next big thing. Yeah, like that. I, I mean, with a, with a show like Jumpstart Your Joy, obviously, I like those little things that really have the ripple effect and that have such a huge mm-hmm. impact and are kind of genius in their simplicity. Right? Cause, exactly. Exactly. Cause the, also the reality is people don't want to think too much. Like mm, people don't want to yeah. reinvent their own wheel. Like it's, I think that there are some, there are so many things that, that um, are disruptive in the industry that are great and are moving us forward. Oh yeah. Um, but then there's also some stuff that's like, there's no need for so much complexity around going to the grocery store or doing, you know, X, Y, and Z or buying this. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of things that we can do that are just simple solutions that provide value. And so whenever, you know, people ask me that they, I want to start a business, I don't know where to begin. I always just encourage them to just look for pain. And it sounds weird, but it's like, I call it inspiration from frustration. So Mm -hmm. next time you're frustrated about something or next time something doesn't go your way or something's taking a long time or why is, you know, the line at the post office always so long or like, I can't, you know, open this can of pickles or whatever it is. What can you do to (laughs) make that easier for yourself? And what could that be to make that easier for other people? And so sometimes it's just looking for those areas of pain that you can fix that is are the best ideas. Yeah. And I think, oh, yeah. And I know you have more around this one as well. But like, isn't that kind of why we all love Shark Tank that like, these people Mm -hmm. listen to that little inner nudge of, okay, so here's one of the really silly ideas. My friends like to sit around, my friends and I like to sit around and make up fake things. One of them is called the culottes, which are self cooling shorts. Somebody else, oh now it's God. out there. Y'all can make this, the culottes. Anyway, but isn't that why we like Shark Tank? Is because that is people, so somebody, funny. somebody actually makes the thing that you're like, oh, we were joking around about that. Not that I've seen culottes. Right, myself. exactly. Like, like I was joking around one time about, I always have my ideas in the shower. And I was like, mm. I'd love like a shower Sharpie that you oh, could yeah. write on your shower walls. You know, because then of course you get out of the shower and you, put the towel around your head and then you forget everything that you just thought of <laughs> while mm-hmm. you were in the shower. And then people were like tagging me. I think I posted on Instagram or something and they were like, Oh, it exists. And I'm like, man, but yeah, it's, it's, it's like, why not just noodle on things? I think yeah. we talk ourselves out of so much before we even begin. And cause there's every reason in the book not to do something you can think oh. about how many businesses fail. You can think about how much time you have or how busy you already are or what the weather's like that day. And and so there's so much airtime that we give in our heads to what could go wrong. And Mm -hmm. it's like, imagine if we gave that same amount of airtime to what could go right. Like, Mm -hmm. would we move a little bit more further in our ideas and the things we want to do if we thought about what's possible and not what would stand in our way? Yeah. Mm, Yes, totally agree with that. And then once you've started putting the energy towards the thing, I mean, culottes wasn't my thing, but like a podcasting (laughs) class was, and and that became a thing for me. And now is a major part of what my my business is because I saw so many kind of like created by big entrepreneurs. And then it was more, quite frankly, of like a lead magnet for them. And so they were putting it out there, but missing huge steps. And I'm like, right. wait, I can't start a podcast yeah. with that information. So what do I need? And from my notes You're came filling this the gap. class. Yeah. 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 Like it, it, it was a similar experience for me starting Mic Drop Workshop, mm, the yeah. course that I started this summer, actually right before um, we met at the conference was... I would get a lot of questions from women who have these amazing stories and they want to 
go on stage and tell them as a professional speaker. And it was kind of this thing where I was like, would it be helpful to create an online course of just everything that I know about speaking professionally and getting paid to do it? Because there's also a huge demand for female speakers because that's been, been lacking to say the least on, on <laughs> some um, uh, lineups. There's actually like a trending Tumblr account called Manals that are like all male panels <laughs> that people call out. <laughs> But it was something that I was like, okay, um, yes, an online course might take some time to create. Will there be like a bunch of like back end stuff? Is there already enough courses out there about um, professional speaking? And there was just, of course, a laundry list of things that I could say, no, it's not the right time. But then there was just this one thing where I was like, what if this could launch one person's speaking career where they could make a huge impact through their story and an income while doing it just for like one person, would that be worth it to me? And it was. And so I did it. And now that's turned into hundreds of amazing women and an awesome community um, at Mic Drop Workshop. But it's like just watering the flowers more than you water your weeds. It's like, what could bloom from this and make that more exciting than what could go wrong? And if somebody wants to find the mic drop workshop where do they find that yeah you can go to micdropworkshop.com and Mm -hmm. um and check it out there's a a webinar that um kind of shows you a little bit of what what i'm about and some tips on public speaking and then we have a mastery course that is everything i know about um, from crafting a keynote to getting paid to tell it where to find gigs and then if you're in the mastery course you're in this closed facebook group for women who are also in it And we refer each other to gigs and um, post stuff for feedback. And it's been really just like, it's taught me a lot too. I've learned a lot from all the women in the group and it's been a really cool experience. I can't imagine if I would have just closed the door on it because Mm, of all the doubts that we naturally have, you know? Yeah. And I'll link up to that in the show notes. I agree. The same thing. It's amazing. The things from the podcast class that I've learned because questions get asked and I'm like, oh, I need to research that because I haven't even thought about yeah. it. Or just hearing Definitely. where people happen too. Yeah, where people get stuck and like realizing like, oh, there's more here that's super interesting, kind of about like where can I add some coaching around these things? Yeah, to be in that definitely. Space. Like I just added a module to it, you know, even though the course has been done for like six months about I added, you know, how to collect emails from the stage, because that was something that kept coming up. And I'm like, okay, there's that gap. It's cool to be able to provide something that teaches people to fish too, you know, like a class um, and, and kind of help create like something of value that mobilizes people has been a a really cool journey this, this year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The other really juicy part right there that I love is that you went forth with the idea and launched it and then it has grown. And I think there's a really interesting nugget right there about like it. you don't have to to listeners if you're like, I don't know how to do an e-course or a course like you don't have to have all the things figured out right up front. Right. You don't have to know everything to put it out there. You probably already know enough about a subject to create. Right. Exactly. And you can add yeah. to it as you go because you're going to learn. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And just, I think it's it's great that Mike Drop has grown. But mm-hmm. I also want to point out that I've started things that haven't grown. Sure. <laughs> and, yes. and you live to tell about it. And, <laughs> and yep. maybe they, like, I think the best kind of confidence that you can have is when you realize that there's life after mistakes. Because... It, it then it really mobilizes you to go for it. Um, mm-hmm. And if you try five different things and one of them works, that's still a huge win. So even though Headbands of Hope has been successful, Mic Drop Workshop has been successful, there have been things that I have dabbled in that have not taken off. And I just try to be really open and honest about that because I think um, in this age of like social media and, and oh, yeah. you know, blogs and everything. It's like everyone's winning all the time. Mm, (laughs) Yes. That's how we, and then I think that's why we're in this like self-esteem crisis is we feel like we're the only ones that are messing up at something. And I, this is my personal mission because it's something that I've really struggled with in my anxiety too is comparison. And uh, it's 
once you really pull back the curtains, though, and you get to know people, you realize that nothing is really what it seems. And uh, everyone's had those struggles. This is not what we're posting on our blogs. And so, yeah, I just really like to preface that whenever I talk about a win, that it is always coupled with many losses along the way. Yeah, I'm super glad you brought that up because I think it is, it's also the fun and exciting thing to talk about on a podcast or a show or whatever is to to list accomplishments and achievements. And it doesn't always, what? It doesn't always honor the fullness of a person to just check all those exactly. things off. Yeah, because yeah, obviously- well said. I like the term honoring the fullness. It's, that's, <laughs> okay. that's a beautiful way to put it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, because yeah. for sure, I think a lot of people in in the audience, I, I mean, and that's why I like to kind of go through people's stories in the breadth of who they are, because there's a lot mm-hmm. to learn. And, you know, the the basis even for this show was being in a place where I was kind of, at, well, I was near rock bottom and just said, I want more. I don't know what more is, but there's more than this moment. And I'm going to go mm-hmm. find it. Yeah. It, and knowing that well, from that, that moment, like the things... best part too of like yeah. is when I think rock bottom is when, and not even rock bottom. That sounds like really bad, but even just <laughs> I think whenever we're in good places, you don't you don't like you're not like actively trying to move away from that. Mm-hmm. But when we're in maybe places where things aren't going so great, that's when you move to try to be better a lot of great things happen when things aren't going so well because you don't want to stay there. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that that's like when you become resourceful, when you become creative, when you have more ideas, it's because you're scrambling sometimes. And mm. I like, I know like a product and I think it's something I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but it's like a hair curling product. I think it's called Miss Jessie's. Mm-hmm. And I met the founder and she started it because her salon was failing and she was a single mom trying to, you know, provide a good life for her kid. She was in a bad neighborhood. And so she decided that she needed to find another source of income. And she had this big curly hair that she would make her own hair cream for because she couldn't find it on the market. Mm-hmm. Started selling that. And now they're a target. But mm-hmm. like, maybe she would have never made that hair cream if her salon was going really well. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah, because it kind of gives us maybe the nudge of bravery or courage that wouldn't mm-hmm. have necessarily, maybe the idea was already there, but it's in those moments where we're like, no, like, what, what? I think it's Elizabeth Gilbert that says something about you finally get tired of your own bullshit. And that's like, <laughs> that's when yeah, change happens. It's totally. like, ah, no, there's something else here. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think sometimes when I sit on an idea too long, mm-hmm. like I I start to get mad at myself because I'm like, what are you doing? If you're still thinking about it, then obviously, so because you know, there's a lot of. I'm not saying like every time you have an idea, go for it because not yeah. all of our ideas are worthy of us stopping what we're doing and pursuing them. But where I think ideas, like the ones that stick and the ones like when you're just driving in the car, you know, and not thinking about anything. And then you start thinking about that, like those things that kind of keep coming back Mm. are ones that I think are worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. And so when that happens to me, I'm like, what am I, you know, it's almost like you start, like you said, kind of get your own BS. You're just like, just do it. And (laughs) then sometimes the like even the failure of that idea feels better than the regret of, of not doing it. It's like, okay, I crossed it off my list. Mm -hmm. Um, It didn't work or it turned into this, which I didn't expect. And like that in its own will always feel better than sitting in your car driving, wondering why you never pursued it. Yeah. Ooh, that is almost (laughs) so close to the Will (laughs) Ferrell quote that you put up Oh, yeah, which yeah. I am literally looking at. Do you want to give it to us or I could I could read oh, it? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I I okay. So Will Farrell, one of my favorite people, and anyone uh who knows me know that I once chased him down at a football game and begged him to take a picture with me and I cherish that picture. But awesome. um he said, But my fear of failure never approached in magnitude my fear of what if. What if I never try it at all? And um 
I mean, and he has a really interesting story too. I, I recommend reading, um, and maybe you can link this, is uh, his speech at graduation for USC. And he kind of talks about his early days and uh, no one would read the Anchorman scripts. And even like, even when he started winning at some things, he was still losing at others. And, and so that's, yeah, I'm so glad that we bonded over that quote. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Well, I think there's something so raw and truthful about what he does, like the emotions that he kind of conjures up. Like we see ourselves in him when he's acting, at least I do. I don't know. You know, I'm four foot yeah. 10. I don't know how I'm relating to like this large man, but, <laughs> but there's also something, there's a connection through humor. Like we feel really close to him or I do because of the way he's vulnerable in being funny. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. I feel the same way, but it's so funny because there's a very high likelihood that me and you are the only two people that feel this way <laughs> about Will Ferrell. And so I'm just like picturing like people listening to this podcast, like what the heck, you know, why they love Will Ferrell, but no, For a weird I, reason. Reason, but I, yeah, exactly. Um, no, but I, and that's like, I appreciate humor so much that I, I really, I think when I first started speaking professionally, I thought that I had to put on this persona of, like, I'm this businesswoman that has it all together. And like, right. you know, look at my structure that I've done and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it was just like, um, I didn't like giving that talk because it wasn't myself. I don't think it was helping too many people. And mm. once I kind of like, like threw the papers in the air and decided just to be myself and be funny and be real, that was when, that was when the demand went up. That was when I was on planes a hundred times a year, you know, so it's, yeah. that's what people want. And that's what people connect with is that realness that I think will, I like to call him will, yeah. um, oh, well, yeah. is, does, you know, in, in his acting. And that's when I um, really appreciate entrepreneurs or p anyone who's kind of ever reached some level of success, but that can still not feel like they're trapped in a persona of success. I love that. I love all of that so much. And it's interesting. I'll link up to the show for, with Andrea Owen, because she and I talked a lot about like how to be taken seriously when like you're not a serious person. And I think it's the same yeah. thing because I got so, I mean, you know, I, after leaving academia, not that I taught, but like after, you know, getting degrees, you kind of feel like yeah. the measure of success or whatever is this kind of very serious I don't know, a kind of a, a rehash of what you've seen these professors do for however many years you've been there. Totally. But that's not, I mean, sure, that's the place and time for it. But like that persona, I mean, yeah. <laughs> no one's and tuning I, into this podcast for report on those things. Like, whatever. Right. Yeah, there's not going to be multiple choice at the end of this. But <laughs> no. um, I, I was awful in school. Not that I wasn't trying. I just wasn't a natural test taker. I wasn't good at mm. like memorizing things. And I just wasn't, uh, it, and I want to say awful. Like it was, um, I went to my high school that I went to was this really small, like college prep school where every single student could, you know, recite like all the digits of pi. And like, it was, <laughs> right. it was very academically driven. And so yeah. I did not, I really continuously felt like I never measured up and it was and I remember like when college acceptances started coming out it was the, the thing to do was to post your acceptance letters on your locker and so oh. like out on the outside of it and I right. just remember feeling like absolute crap because I'm you know not getting into these schools and um, my SAT scores weren't that great. And, and the, all the people around me were, you know, Harvard, Yale and like Cornell. And I ended up, you know, going to this, this great school. And it was, I, college was really where I felt like I found my, like more of a holistic approach to who I am and not just yeah. answering A, B, C or D. <laughs> but, um, it's like, it was a huge stressor for me growing up and like really messed with my identity and my confidence. I was being told that I wasn't good enough, you know, because that's what these yeah. grades for me were, were telling you. 
so yeah, that was hard. That's something I feel really strongly about too. Uh, and when I, you know, try to speak at school, it's, it's, it's not just about, you know, the, the numbers on paper, you know, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Are you being active yeah. in your community? Are you, I'm actually on the board of this nonprofit called District C where they pair high school students with startups and businesses in the local community and they solve like a real world problem for them and give them solutions to one problem that they're experiencing. And yes. it's so cool. And that's what gets me excited about education is like real problem solving, group work, things like that. But it was a it was a big pressure to my identity growing up for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting because I I was good at English, but really I I think it was more of a confidence thing around math and maybe not being so good mm-hmm. at multiple choice questions. Yeah. But yeah, poured I scored really poorly. I mean like <laughs> really poorly on the ACTs. And it was a, a one, another one of those things where it was like, oh my gosh, like, you know, one, what if people find out? Like, you know, it, it just, it really can put you in a spiral, but knowing that like on oh, the other yeah. side of that, yes, it's important to try and do your best at school, but there's also a lot more to who you become and like what your gifts are and what you might be doing um, later in life that have nothing to yeah. do with those abilities at all. Exactly. Like, I almost feel like uh, school, <laughs> this is going to sound ridiculous, but it, sh- there's, it should be more like an escape room. You know, like, who mm. is going to figure it out? Because I might not know, I might not be a really good trivia partner, or I might not um, score the highest, you know, on a test. But if you, like, lock me in somewhere, or if you throw me in the middle of, like, a jungle, like, I'm going to figure it out. And I'm confident in that. And that was one thing that I thought that most people had, but I realized that 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 they don't. And just sometimes not knowing can put you in a state of fear. And so I, one thing that I do think that I'm good at is even when I don't know something, I still know that I can, and I still know that I will. And so I think that that's what I wasn't really, you know, measured in in school is the grit and tenacity that you have to have to to do things and to pursue things and be resilient because, you know, it's just, it's either A, B, C, or D, or it's either true or false. And there's, it doesn't really give you that window um, to really like test your, your core um, Mm -hmm. of just not knowing where you're going, but know that you're going to get there. So that's one thing that took me like a few years and still taking me is to be okay with not having all the experience or all the skills, but still knowing that I'll figure it out. Yeah. So many entrepreneurs are a really great example of kind of what tapping into to being really crafty in the different mm-hmm. kinds of ideas that come up and like, how do you solve problems and how do you get super creative? And, and those things, at least in my experience, are not necessarily the things that can even be taught. I mean, they can be encouraged, mm-hmm. but then it's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I don't, I don't, I don't know as a parent, I have an eight-year-old, I don't know how to best instill that in my child other than encouraging him to look for ways to solve problems and be creative. You know, like it's, it's interesting. Right. It's, yeah. How do you teach it? Yeah. I, I think about that too. Cause a lot of people ask me, you know, me starting a business and in my speeches, I share how my sister is an ultra marathon runner and she runs like hundred mile races. And people ask us like, well, what did your parents do to make you, me and my sister be, you know, such risk takers. And it really wasn't like, it wasn't like they sat us down and talked to us about, you know, certain like morals or like cause effects and they'll probably kill me if they're listening to this it wasn't you know such a like in your face parenting that they did that I mean for example my mom she biked from New York to California and my dad he played division one football and then did had a startup that he did for 10 years and left his you know left his job to do it and like so they kind of led by example in that um, and I think it was their reaction to opportunities that if there was a team that you could try out for or like a play that the city was putting on or like, oh, there's an audition for a commercial. Oh, you don't have any acting experience? Who cares? Let's go and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. and it's like, like, I remember I found out that, did you ever watch a show all that? Or no, I didn't. Nickelodeon. 
no. uh, with like Amanda Bynes, like back in the day, it was, it was my jam. And they were like coming to my city, like for auditions. And I had like no acting experience, no singing, no dancing. And I was like, mom, like, you know, all that auditions are coming. And she's like, let's go like pack your bags. And it was never like, well, maybe you should take singing lessons first or like maybe, you know, um, you're not cut. It was always like, yes. And we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And when things didn't go my way, obviously all that didn't go my way. (laughs) Never got a (laughs) call back, but, but it was, I think they let us cry. They let us get rejected, which I think was really healthy. They didn't ever shield us from rejections, even when they probably knew I I had a feeling my mom probably knew I wasn't going to make it on a national television show, but, (laughs) but they, they let us feel that. But then consciously, I think, every time that happened, you know, it hurt less and less. And so right. by the time we're 20 somethings trying to figure it out, some radical things don't seem that radical because yeah. we've kind of warmed ourselves up to it. So what other things do you have coming up if somebody's listening and they're like, ooh, I want to I want to learn more about Jess or Headbands of Hope? Yeah, well, um, I would love if you reached out, you can find me on Instagram at Jess underscore Ekstrom. Um, our website for Headbands of Hope is headbandsofhope.com. We also have a Headband Hero program if you're interested in volunteering with that, kind of like a brand ambassador. Mm-hmm. Um, and then some, and then uh, Mic Drop Workshop, if you're interested in speaking, uh, you can go to micdropworkshop.com. But um, the big thing that's kind of in the in the lineup right now is I um, just turned in my manuscript for a book that I have coming out with Harper Collins, November 2019. And so this is the uh, my bigger project that I've been working on that I'm just super excited about. So we're about to start the editing phase, but that's that's what's in the pipeline. Super nervous, excited, scared, happy, all all the feels towards it. So exciting. Congratulations. Ooh, I can't wait to thank you. I can't you. wait to see it. <laughs> and then a couple questions that I've been asking everyone this season is, and this one's kind of open-ended. So what comes to you when you think of the crossroads of action, intention, and joy? And joy. I think of like, I think of just like a purposeful life. I just think the things that I, I want to do, I want to be anchored to them by something real. And I think that's what brings you joy is when you're doing something that's meaningful to you. I think we're more actionable when we believe in the end result. And I think our work is better when we're intentional towards it. Mm, that's, that's a good one. Thank you. And then last and most joyfully, what are three ways that you can think of to jumpstart joy in your life, in the world, or in other people's lives? Oh, okay. So I think number one, and I kind of talked about this in the beginning that I'm trying to do that I'm working on is unplug, find ways to remove yourself from the screen and the attachments to technology and just kind of see where it takes you, whether that's with people or a walk in the park. Number two for me is play. Like I love playing games. I love like being silly and fun and wrestling with my dog on the floor or going and playing tennis and not being able to get it over the net. And just like, (laughs) um, just being able to play is something that I like know that is so important that sometimes I lose because we're so caught up in the seriousness of what we feel like we're doing when Mm -hmm. it's not that serious. Just take 20 minutes and, and, and play maybe for your next meeting. It's not at a coffee shop. It's at a park, you know, just take some time to play. Mm-hmm. And three, for me, the, the book writing experience has been really eye opening to what writing can do for you. Yeah. So having to meet this deadline, I've had to be really disciplined about writing every day. And it's just really helped me sort out some of my thoughts and feelings. And it, I kind of consider writing like, and journaling, like looking under the bed, because sometimes yeah. when you're scared, you have this like anxiety feeling because there's all this stuff that's in your head and you're not really sure like where to go. And then when you write it, it's it usually you kind of let it, it 
solves itself. And it's like looking under the bed and realizing that nothing's there. Like nothing is really that bad. And Mm -hmm. there's nothing that's too big for you to handle. So being disciplined of writing, actually a service that I use to help me is called um, Dabble. It's like an online journal that sends you an email every day that prompts you with like a journaling question uh, and keeps track of all your entries. So that's something that's helpful for me. Awesome. Yay. I will link up to that. And thank you so much, Jess. It's been so much fun having you on the show today. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Jess, thanks so much for being on the show. I am so glad that we bumped into each other at the Mavenly conference and I cannot wait to have you back after you've published your book in November. If you want to find out more about this conversation and follow some of those links, you can find the show notes for this episode at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash Jess. And if you want to find out more about how to start a podcast of your own, (laughs) you can find the link to that cheat sheet I referenced at the site as well. Just click on the start a podcast button. And let's see, on the show next week, I'll be doing a solo cast and I'm going to spend a little bit more time around how to really embrace kind of the silly side of yourself because I feel like it's coming up big both in this conversation with Jess, the conversation with Andrea Owen, you can get that link in the show notes as well, but like how to really embrace silliness and just abundant joy that comes out in kind of those goofy ways and why I think it really is a beautiful place that you can find a lot of inspiration. So that'll be on the show next week. I hope you'll come back for that. And until then, I hope that your days are filled with so much joy. 